guys, how's it going? Welcome back. Today I'm in this 2001 Land Rover Discovery 2 with a 4 litre V8 petrol engine. As many of you know, I'm a big Land Rover fan. In fact, I think some of you think I must have Stockholm Syndrome. But I just won't hear a bad word said against them. I like the Discovery 3, 4 and 5. I think the Discovery Sport's very good. I thought the Land Rover Freelander 2 was very good. And I just love all Range Rovers. Naturally then, you'll expect me to spend the next 10 minutes singing this Discovery 2's praises. Well, I won't be doing. I just don't think they're good cars. In fact, when people bash Land Rovers for being thirsty, unreliable, and just generally wasteful, I think it's the Discovery 2 that they're referring to. This puts me in a tricky position because whenever I criticise a car, all of the die-hard fans come out of the woodwork and get very personal and then have to start blocking people. It happened quite recently when I said that the MG3 was just a cheap Chinese attempt to cash in on the MG badge which is true by the way. Instead what I'm going to try to do with this Discovery 2 is put a positive spin on it. Instead of sitting here for the next 10 or 12 minutes and hear me moaning and rambling about how bad things are, I'm going to try and, try and be a bit more upbeat. Let's see how it goes. Firstly when you try and start the car, Land Rover have thought of a very clever anti-theft device. You see they've placed the ignition barrel just too close to the rest of the dash, so nobody with big hands can actually start the Discovery. This means that at 3 in the morning, when there's a burglar trying to steal the Discovery, he won't be able to do it. Now that is very clever, Land Rover. Very clever indeed. When you've practiced enough times and perfected the hand movement, and you eventually learn to start the car, then the lovely sounding 4 litre V8 will fire into life. And it does sound beautiful, to be fair. Something that's very clever about this engine is once it reaches about 10 years old, it starts to produce its own mayonnaise, which if you've got an entrepreneurial streak, you'll be able to cash in on. Every time you open the oil filler cap, there'll be more white gold for you to harvest. This thing is literally a gold mine. Don't think that the mobile Hellman's maker is unique to the petrol engine either, because I've had a few TD5s over the years with the same issue. Whether you buy the turbo diesel or the V8 model, you'll become very familiar with your local petrol station. But just think of all those nectar points you'll be able to earn. Every couple of months you'll be entitled to a new toaster, or kettle, or even a 32-inch LCD TV. The benefits really are endless. The TD5 will average about 20 miles per gallon, and this petrol V8 will do about 15. You might think that because there's a glorious sounding 4 litre V8 petrol engine under the bonnet, that this thing is something of a licence loser. Well, Land Rover have you back once again. They've only managed to extract 184 horsepower from it, so your licence is safe as houses. The other good thing is if you drive it very carefully and you gently feather the accelerator, occasionally you'll manage to get 17 or even 18 miles per gallon from it. If you go for the 5-speed manual model, the clutch is so heavy it will constantly tone your calf muscles, which you'll be grateful of in later life. The other good thing is when the clutch needs replacing, it'll set you back about £1,000, which means £200 of that £1,000 will go straight to the government in VAT, so they can do things like, you know, house the homeless and fix potholes. So that's good, isn't it? The other £800, of course, will go to your local mechanic, so he can take his children on a holiday. It really is a win-win. If you went for the automatic model like this, it will always entertain you because you just never know what gear to expect. Luckily, it's a four-speed automatic, so there aren't that many ratios to choose from. Excuse the sweat here, the air conditioning is not working, which again is a good thing because it's cleaning my pores. If you went for the diesel automatic, that one is so ponderously slow it gives you plenty of time to relax and centre yourself. It's very zen. Let's do the old bypass test. So I'm doing 30 miles an hour, foot to the floor. Oh, kick down into, I guess, second. 50 miles an hour. Oh, I'm in top gear. 55 miles an hour. 60, way hey. I think we'll stick at 60. This generation of Discovery ran from 1998 until 2004, and it's very popular with outdoorsy people. You know, people who like to go kayaking or camping. And Land Rover know this, and they've designed this car specifically with that audience in mind. You see, when it reaches 10 or 12 years old, the glue that holds the headlining up will disintegrate, so the headlining will start to sag, which makes it feel like you're in a tent. Also, when it rains, the sunroofs will leak, which will force cold air down the back of your neck which again, just reminds you of the great outdoors, doesn't it? It's that sort of attention to detail you just don't get with other manufacturers. Next up, this being a large 4x4, you'd think it would be the ideal car to haul your family around in, wouldn't you? The trouble is, nowadays, with obesity on the rise, you don't want your loved ones getting chubbier and more diabetic, do you? 
well, Andrew ever thought of this. In the middle row, there's not much room at all. There's also not much room to get in or out, which means by the time your loved ones have shoehorned the way in, they'll think twice about having that second portion of dinner, won't they? Reducing the risks of diabetes and obesity. Now in the back, there are two more seats. When I was a kid, my dad had a K-Reg 200 series, and then he replaced that with an M-Reg 300 series. And they had those fold-down jump seats, which as a kid, I thought were great fun. But with this Series 2 Discovery, they were given the axe in favour of these forward-facing seats, which I don't know for sure, but I imagine this was some sort of EU regulation to make sure that your kids were safe. Those interfering idiots in Brussels. Anyway, these two seats in the back will force your children to become more intelligent and to think outside the box, because they don't fold up or down in a very logical way. Folding these seats down with kids crying in the background really could be a new game on the Crystal Maze. It helps if you have a PhD in engineering and you're an origami enthusiast. Speaking of lateral thinking, the central locking in this car will also keep you on your toes. Sometimes the rear locks just don't unlock at all. Which again, I think this is Land Rover being, being ultra safe and secure. They wanted to prevent carjackings, obviously. Nowadays, start-stop systems are commonplace, aren't they? I bet you didn't know it was Land Rover who invented it first. Well, watch this. You sat here, the engine's idling. You press the central locking button, the engine dies. No more pollution, no more CO2. The Green Party will love it. Let's try and start it again. There we go. They also have a self-leveling air suspension system on the rear, which can occasionally fail. But that just makes getting into the back far more easier. There should be an actual step on it as well, but that fell off because it was a bit rusty. But we won't, we won't talk about that. The other good thing is that hydraulic step frequently fails, which is why you'll see so many Discovery 2s with the step hanging down on the floor. Now, this again is very good for parking because it, it makes it a, a rudimentary parking sensor of sorts because when you back up to something, that will touch the curb first. You know, so you don't damage any of the tail lights. What else can I tell you about it? You know what, I give up. I, I can't pretend that this is a good car. I don't mean this particular one, I mean the Discovery 2 in general. I don't think it'll become collectible, like a Ranger of a Classic or a Defender will. It's not nice to drive, it's not nice to look at, the steering's all over the place, the brakes shouldn't be relied on. It's big, heavy, clumsy and cumbersome. But it's not very reliable, and they rust too. It crashes, as I'm sure you've heard throughout this video, it crashes all over the place. And the body roll is something else, it should come with a warning. Warning, going around corners may cause sickness. The driving position is ridiculously high. It feels as though you're on stilts. It just feels like a dinosaur. It sits on the road like, like an 8-track in a sea of iPods. I've had countless of these cars in my time and they've always bit me on the bum. Always. I had a 2002 model once which had faulty rear air suspension. Shock. So I had that fixed. And the guy that I sold it to traded in an S-Reg version of this car, which was as rotten as a pear. And he had the cheek to accuse me of doing a dodgy MOT on it, because he said it was rusty. Well, it's a 15-year-old Discovery or whatever it was at the time. What do you expect? I don't even do my own MOTs, so how could I have passed a dodgy one? Anyway, he had the people from Vosa come round to inspect the MOT station that I used, to make sure that it was alright, which it was in the end. I took another one once in part exchange, and the guy that traded it in was about five feet tall. So the seat was stuck very close to the dash. And not only had the cable adjuster snapped, but also the electronic controls weren't working. So I jumped in it to drive, smashed my knees on the dash. The windows were all faulty, so it wouldn't work. The air conditioning didn't work. And as I tried to get out of the car, the door latch broke. So there I was, trapped in this sweaty old Discovery. In the end, I had to climb out through the back door. I took another one in parts exchange once from a regular customer and he told me that it was parts outside his mechanics because they couldn't fix it. So I went along to his mechanics in a neighbouring village with my booster pack, got it going and because it had been sat there for six months all the interior was mouldy and disgusting. So I drove it then about 30 minutes or 35 minutes down to my mechanics but for some reason every single time I tried to adjust the, uh, the steering wheel the horn sounded. You can picture the scene, can't you? There I was trying to discreetly move this barely legal discovery down to my mechanics, 
and every single small correction of the steering wheel, hark, hark, like that. Can you imagine? The 30 minutes of that. In the end, I was so glad that it overheated, I had to turn it off. They are very good off-road, these cars, but then so are lots of other cars. So is the Land Cruiser, so is the Shogun, so is the Suzuki Jimny. Just buy one of those instead. I'm probably being a bit harsh on the Discovery because this particular car is now 20 years old. When they first came to the UK scene back in 1990, they were ahead of the time and they were very popular. But by 2001, you had things like the BMW X5 on the road, the Mercedes ML, the new shape Range Rover, and these just all felt prehistoric in comparison. This car, believe it or not, still uses the underpinnings of the 1970 Range Rover. It just feels woefully outdated. Park this next to a 1998 ML320, and this looks like something you'd see on a caveman's wall. Anyway, I tried my best with this car, I tried to be positive. So, thank you once again for watching. Make sure you give the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. You can follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. I'll leave the link below. If you've got any comments or questions, let me know. And I'll do my best to get back to you. Make sure you check out the High Peak store, by the way, because I've got some new merch. Merch. That is highpeakstore.co.uk. Couldn't be easier. So check it out. Cheers, guys. Thanks very much. See you next time. Thank you.